Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? I would like to start by saying thank you to all of you for coming here. I appreciate it, and thank you for taking time this evening to, to join us while we uh, discuss cybersecurity and bring the community together, hopefully to make everybody a little bit safer. Uh, for those of you who are not 100% aware of what we're doing here, my name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I'll be speaking tonight. I'm a member of the Phoenix Linux Users Group, and in addition to that, I work here at the Chandler Police Department. I'm actually a computer programmer here at the PD. Uh, our PD is sort of special in that way in that we do have a very, very good information technology team uh, in terms of we uh, employ uh, computer programmers, developers. We have uh, our own server team. We have lots of people who are doing a lot of really neat stuff here. In addition to that, uh, a lot of us have a, a very large interest in cybersecurity, obviously, right? Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about some of the technical parts. Uh, in addition to that, for those of you who have already read either the meetup or the announcements uh, that were put out, uh, we're going to discuss VPNs, tours, proxies. We're going to talk about some of the changes that are going on. I'm sure some of you have seen in the media and in the news that uh, there are a lot of changes. A lot of things are happening right now in security and in uh, how they're handling the laws and what they can do with your data. Uh, one of the major items of business is going to be the fact that uh, your internet service provider potentially will be allowed to take your information, mine it, and then sell it. And I know for a lot of people that's a, that's a major concern. That, that is something that folks do not uh, enjoy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to discuss some of the things that you could potentially do uh, and some of the things that you may need to do. So the first order of business that I'd like to talk about is our performance objectives. And uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of what you're going to learn tonight. So the number one thing is I want you all to be able to identify the amount of entropy required to identify an individual online. When you're online or when you're using your computer, with enough information about you, somebody can identify who you are. So even though it may say we collect anonymous data, we don't have anything to link back to you, so on and so forth, with enough information, potentially that anonymous data is no longer anonymous. The next order of business is we're going to identify the three major psychographic segments targeted by advertisers. What do they want this information for? Why do they need it? What are they going to use it for? Potentially, what is going to be in a database that is about you? We're going to identify one type of marketing that uses tracking, at least. We're going to discuss a whole bunch of stuff tonight. But when you walk away from this, I want you to at least be able to identify one company and one type of marketing that they're using that's going to be able to gather your data and use that data somewhere. In addition to that, we're going to understand what a proxy is, we're going to understand what a VPN is, and we're going to understand what Tor does. Just because you're using a tool to anonymize your traffic, that is not a, a silver bullet. Just because you went out and spent a couple of dollars to buy yourself a VPN, that does not guarantee that they're not going to be collecting your data. Because there are more than one way to collect your information, to find out what you're doing, where you're going. Uh, and then in addition to that, potentially, if you're buying your VPN from certain people, uh, they could be just collecting that data and selling it anyways. So you connect to the VPN, they collect that data instead, send it out to somebody, and that sort of subsidizes the cost of your VPN. We have some seats up here in the front as well, just in case you, you need something. Um, So to get started, I want to discuss privacy. I want to discuss what privacy really is and how privacy applies to us. So privacy is defined as the condition of being free from observation or disturbance. The right to privacy is not guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, although the right to privacy is implicitly granted in the First Amendment, Third, Fourth, and Fifth. Your right to privacy has been a justification for many civil liberties cases. In addition, most of the states recognize four torts based on your right to, pri to privacy. This is going to include intrusion upon private affairs, public disclosure of private facts, false revelations or publicity about a person, 
and assuming the name or likeness of a person to deceive or for gain. So this is very important because when the news discusses privacy and when they talk about the things that are going on with whether or not they can sell your data and so on and so forth, um, there isn't a overarching guarantee of your privacy. Really it's up to you as opposed to up to uh, a group or a, a nameless association of people who come together to decide what is and what isn't private amongst you. Because for each one of us, privacy is going to be an individual thing. Some things that you don't want people to know about, other people may not have any concerns about. And then vice versa. However, especially on the internet, most of us assume that when you're behind a computer, anything that you do, or say, or type into that computer, in general, if they don't have your name, then they don't know who you are, right? You can sit at a computer and you can do anything behind that computer and nobody can find you, nobody can figure out who you are. All of this sounds wrong to most of us. Most of us are aware that just because you're sitting at a computer typing into it and you haven't given somebody your name, that does not mean that they cannot identify you. Uh, that identification is discussed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or the EFF. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a group whose primary focus is in uh, privacy and computer laws and um, their method of their method of working is they go out and they they lobby they talk to people they try to change laws they work on these things so the EFS EFF is very important if you're not aware of the EFF I, I really do urge you to go to EFF.org head on over to their webpage read about them read about some of the stuff that they discuss because a lot of this is very interesting but one of the things that they do provide is a mathematical formula that allows an individual to measure how likely you are to be able to use information you have about that person to reveal their unique identity. So you can take anonymous data, and if you have enough of that anonymous data, eventually you can look at it and you can find the patterns that would reveal who that person is within that anonymous data. And that quantity is called entropy, and it's measured in bits. And you may not be able to see it in the back here, but right here I have 2 to the 33rd power, and that comes out to about 8 billion, 8.5 billion. We have about approximately 7.1, 7.2 billion people on the planet Earth right now. Uh, it requires, in general, two items of information to be able to narrow down to a single person but we need that information to add up to about 33 bits. Right about. Now, depending on who you are and how uh, unique you are, it may be easier to find you. So if you drive a Ferrari and you look online about Ferraris and you spend a lot of time looking at Ferrari videos and maybe Ferrari maintenance, that's something that not a lot of people potentially do. So it's a little bit easier to figure out who you are when looking at your internet surfing traffic and being able to see your interests. You go to Amazon, you buy Ferrari parts, you go to YouTube, you look at Ferrari videos, so on and so forth. Maybe we get a date of birth and a zip code, and at that point we know who you are because we, ha we can narrow down to a location, we can narrow down to an interest, uh, maybe we can narrow down to a gender, and maybe potentially a date of birth. And that's enough to find somebody. So with approximately 8 billion people on the planet Earth, we're going to require about 33 bits of entropy to successfully identify a person in the noise. Those of us who are members of the law enforcement community, we can often think about it like this. We're forced to take incomplete descriptions of people and link that information back to a suspect or a victim. Now, you may have seen informational releases or pleas to the public asking for help in identifying a person. Oftentimes, we'll release information about a person that we need to locate and we'll only have a partial description. But uh, we hope 
that somebody being able to see that information would be able to fill in the blanks. Now this same behavior is very similar to what an advertiser or a data broker would be doing. They trade in anonymized data because with enough anonymized data and enough time to look at it and go through it, they can start to build a very detailed picture about who we are. Whereas with law enforcement, we may be trying to solve a crime or locate a victim or anything else. Somebody using this data for maybe um, selling you something wants just as much information. Now, for some folks, you're probably already thinking to yourself, well, I take steps to prevent this. I'm using ad blocker. I use no script. I have all of these tools that I've set up for myself that should theoretically prevent somebody from being able to fingerprint me. But another item that I'd like to talk about, and this also comes from the EFF, this is part of one of their other projects, is Panopticlick. And if you go to the EFF webpage, you can find this. But Panopticlick is another tool that can be used to fingerprint your browser. So they're not just looking at your interests. They're not just mining the data of where you go or what you click on or any of that other stuff. In addition to that, they're looking at your hardware. So when your computer is connected to the internet and you're surfing the internet, it gives them an idea of what operating system you're using. It gives them an idea of uh, what browser you're using. It gives them version info, which potentially could be used to also fingerprint your installation of your OS. Uh, if you're using an older version of, let's say, Ubuntu, and you do an app git install of Firefox, you may not have the latest copy of Firefox. And if you're on 14.04 long-term support Ubuntu, when they look at that version, they can kind of guess, oh, OK, they're on Linux. They're using this version of Firefox. This gives me a little bit more information. And it's every one of those dots that they can use to build a bigger picture of who you are and what you're doing. In addition to that, um, many of us use accounts. So for those of you who are thinking to yourself, well, I use a VPN and I obfuscate my traffic, and I regularly obfuscate my browser, and nobody's going to know what hardware I have. But every single time you log in to your computer, you're immediately signing into Facebook or Amazon, Twitter, any of the social medias, so on and so forth. They're running things on your computer. They have access to your information. And they already know who you are because of your registered account. When you log into Amazon, you have your name, your shipping information, all of that other stuff in there, and then you're surfing to another web page, and they can follow you. Um, a very, very easy way to identify that is if you head on over to a web page or perhaps do a search on Google, you look for something, and then you go somewhere else, and you're immediately advertised for said product. You've perhaps, I don't know, looked for a coffee pot. And the very next web page that you go to, they're trying to sell you different coffee pots. And perhaps if you've looked at a YouTube video, well, Google using their re-advertising tools. And if you're curious, that was the answer. So there is re-advertising. What they want to do is they want to take everything that you are and everything that you do and use that information to build um, what amounts to your own internet. It's a, the term you often hear is echo chamber. They want you to only see and only hear things that interest you in order to keep you there. Eyes on screen is worth money because the more time you spend looking at different products, the more time that you spend seeing the things that they hope you're interested in, the more likely you are to open up your wallet, perhaps make a purchase, buy something. Eventually, it all goes back to trying to get you to spend money. So when you use a tool like Panopticlick, and I'm going to see if I can do that here. When you come to it, it will say, is your browser safe against tracking? We can choose test me.
and they start breaking it down. Now, this is a little small. Let's see what I can do here. Hey, that looks a little bit better. So they start checking. Are you blocking, tracking ads? Now, some of you may not be able to see there in the back, but I'm using Ad Blocker Plus. In addition to that, I'm using Ghostery. There's tons and tons of different tools. Lots of different things you can add to your browser in order to block some of this stuff. Um, if you really want to block it all, switch to eLinks. It's a fantastic browser. <laughs> For those of you who are not aware of what eLinks is, eLinks is a command line interface browser. Let me see what I can. Uh, let's see if I can demo eLinks. And we may not be able to hit it because of the way that it does its SSL certificates. Nope. Okay. Well, too bad. Uh, so eLinks is a command line interface browser that you can use to uh, surf the internet and it blocks JavaScript. It blocks a lot of cookies. You can set it up to really slim everything down. There's no images. Um, but essentially, you load nothing except for the text. We also check, are your, is your browser blocking invisible trackers? Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to go to a news web page while using Ghostery, oftentimes you're, you'll see up to 23, 24, 25 trackers. Um, web pages like Forbes are larger than the video game Doom, the original Doom. So when you download the front page of some of these news articles, you're downloading a file as large as the video game Doom. That's how big these web pages have grown, simply because of the stuff that they're loading in the background. You're pulling down hundreds of megabytes of information, code, that is being run on your system in order to figure out what you're doing, where you go, why you do it, who you hang out with, what you're interested in, and ultimately, how do we make money off of you? Where do we get paid in what you're doing? That's the, that is the ultimate question about the, the trackers and everything else. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment before we do the full results for fingerprinting. Because I also want to discuss the fact that um, in the news, we've all heard the law has been rolled back. Now your ISP can see what you're doing and sell that information. Well, I can tell you right now, your ISP has always had access to that information, and it has not gone to waste. However, they can now trade it with other companies. They were allowed to do that for a short while, but instead they had tried to give a monopoly on that data brokerage to companies like Facebook and Google, and then they rolled that back to allow your ISP to do it as well. Um, Probably just from the topic itself, you, you can probably tell what my personal opinion is about trading in our data. I personally don't like it, and I would rather have my data private and secure. Um, but if you are using products like Facebook, and you have that installed on your phone, um, if you go check your settings inside of your phone and just take a look for a moment what Facebook accesses, what they look at, they have access to your camera. They have access to your microphone. They have access to your contacts. They have access to your text messages. They can intercept phone calls. They can do a whole lot using your device once you start installing their applications. Now, they're already trading in your data. They're selling your information. They take what you do online. They bundle it up into packages, and they say, we have 650,000 users who love cars, particularly they like blue cars. Would you like to purchase this package of users who like blue cars so you can use that for your advertising or you can use this for, for 
re-advertising or whatever it is that they're going to do with that data. That is a sort of a basic breakdown of how they take that information and they break it up to make it more interesting and more worthwhile for people. Because if you're not aware, traditional advertising of putting out a whole bunch of banners and just filling a web page with banners and just letting it go, shooting it out into the wind and hoping it catches somebody, that business model is essentially dying. There are plenty of companies right now whose sole purpose in life is to churn traffic onto those web pages in order to make them feel that they have eyes on screen and then collect the ad revenue. There, there are businesses whose sole business model is to what amounts to, and if you were to talk to these companies, they would say steal their ad revenue. They pay money for a human being to see the ad. Somebody else sits there and runs a script that runs up the views on that ad. And then at the end of it all, nobody's buying the product, nobody's looking at it. So we are moving to the point where that business model is no longer, uh, no longer viable. It's not there. They can't do that. They need to be able to target people individually in order to make these sales and to make that money worthwhile. Because any other amount of money spent on trying to access the public, it goes nowhere. It's not being used. Does everybody follow so far? So your traffic, it's your ISP, your traffic from home, that is extremely valuable. Extremely. Just show of hands if you all don't mind, and you don't have to if you're not comfortable, but is anybody using an alternative DNS at home? A handful of you? Some of you? Sure. So if you are not using an alternative DNS, every time you type into a browser, everything that you put into your computer that requires a query out to a domain name, that gets logged by your ISP. So I have a funny story that I've talked about with my students. Uh, I, I also work at Mesa Community College um, as an instructor. And I've told my students about this. And there are people who are authors, who are individuals who want to look up information about stories or books. You know, they're, they're trying to find ideas online. And they've typed things into their computer like, how do I kill my husband with poison? And hit enter. Or they've typed something like, what does it feel like to be in a gunfight? Or any of that stuff that they're deciding to do research on. They put stuff into their browser, they hit a button, they wait for the results, they read it, they write their book. And then a few days later, they get a knock on the door. Boop, 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 from law enforcement. Because whatever it was that they were searching for in their computer tripped a flag somewhere, and that alerted on that person and somebody was sent over there to be like, hey, uh, so this whole like kill your husband thing, we should probably talk about that. Let's have a sit down. And then those individuals immediately head to their blogs and they head to Facebook and they head all over the internet to let everybody know, hey, I just had a sit down talk for about 45 minutes with a FBI agent who showed up at my door. Um, plenty of examples of that online if anybody's interested in Googling for it. But even if you're using SSL, even if you're using a VPN or a proxy, if you are not sending or trapping or controlling your DNS in some way, all of that information is headed straight to your ISP because they're the ones that control your access to the internet. And that's extremely valuable because if you're using Google, has anybody ever actually looked at their browser after using Google and it has your search terms up in the browser due to the post request, right? So you go in there into Google and you type in uh, Calico Cats, hit enter, and then up in the top in the browser it says Calico Cats. That search term was sent off to your DNS and is now sitting somewhere at your ISP where they can data mine that. They get that information. So even though you're using SSL and HTTPS and everything's supposed to be secure and nobody's supposed to be able to see anything, whenever you make that request out into the world, they can still see the request. And that is information that they can use in order to fingerprint who you are and what you're doing. And in addition to that, they already have tons of data about you anyways because they have the IP address to your home. 
they have your address, they have your credit card bill, they know who you are, they know how much you're spending, they know whether or not you're willing to pay a little bit extra for just a little bit more speed or you're paying just a little bit less. So they're able to tailor how they're going to market everything to you. And then they pass that information off at a price. Sure. No, you're preventing them from collect collecting the DNS information, which is one more avenue of attack. I'm going to use the term avenue attack because they have multiple ways of gathering information about you, but your DNS is one of the primary ways. Because even if you're using SSL and your traffic is encrypted and they can't see the traffic, it doesn't matter because as long as they have the DNS information, they can still see what you're searching for. And that gives them an idea of what you're doing or what web pages you're surfing to. So they may not be able to see the content of the web page, and they can't capture like your username and password or anything like that. But they can still see within the URL that that DNS had to resolve. They can get a general idea of what you were doing. It is, well, on a personal level, yes, I would recommend changing your DNS. Now there are options, and we're going to talk about some of those options here shortly. Uh, there's one called the Open NIC project. I use that. In addition to that, I was a contributor for a while to the OpenNIC project in terms of running a DNS server for that project. Um, they, that's an option as well. Uh, I like OpenNIC because they have their own list of domain names that they provide, and we'll talk about that as well. So you can register a domain name without having to pay for it and then run it through their service, and anybody else who is on that service using that DNS, they can access that domain. Um, very similar to like if you're running a Tor router and you run your own web page through Tor, then you have your little onion address that you would be able to go to. Similar idea, you're running your own DNS and since you have that, you have access to creating your own URLs there. So I went ahead and clicked the button to continue forward so we can keep talking about the browser a little bit first because this is also important because this is some of the, the initial information that's going to get out there about you. How are you surfing the internet? And they can even see if you're curling pages. So if you're like me and you like to sit there and type curl and then give it a URL and hit the button and pull the whole web page down so that you can look at it offline, they can see that you were hitting their web page with curl or wget, depending on which one you like. So it gives you a score. And they're saying only one in 106,280 browsers have the same fingerprint as mine. And that's from several hundred thousand visitors. Not great. If I were to come back to this page and actually be able to run it um, under e-links, that number would probably be much smaller. They would really be able to find me. Uh, here it says that it conveys 16.7 bits of identifying information. So when I was talking about that entropy, 2 to the 33rd power, my browser alone is going to give them 16.7 bits towards that 33 bits that they need. They need 33 bits total. Just because I surf to their web page, they're already at almost 17 bits. Almost. And of course, depending on the information that they know about me, the remaining number of bits and the remaining amount of information that they need about me, that's going to grow or shrink appropriately. I know for a fact there are other people who work in law enforcement in my neighborhood at home. I know this because I can walk outside in the morning and I can see police cars that are parked in front of people's houses. So if the information that you had about me was this individual works in law enforcement and lives in this specific neighborhood, yes, that lowered the number of people that I could potentially be, but there are other people in my neighborhood who share that. Now, if you start asking, well, I also know that this person owns a Datsun, a little wiener dog. Well, I've walked around my neighborhood with my dog several times. I've never seen anybody else with that kind of dog. 
I've seen pugs, I've seen other dogs, that immediately gives people more information about me where they can identify, oh, we know who this person is. With this amount of information and this amount of information for maybe their ISP, they can put together exactly who I am. So let's look at some of these browser characteristics. They actually break it down into bits that actually builds up exactly what you are. So they have fingerprinting from hash. They have your super cookie test, your screen size and color depth. This is also important when we start talking about Tor. This part right here, screen size and color depth, do not ever run your Tor browser full screen. Because once you do, it gives them an idea of exactly how large your screen is. It's more identifying information about your system. They can identify the computer that you're using by screen size. It is something that they wait. So this knows that my computer is 1920 by 1080 by 24. Just because when I ran the browser, we were full screen. It also checks for browser plugins, time zone. Uh, let's see what else is in here that's pretty interesting. Right here, system fonts. This is a great one. They check for your system fonts. What do you have available on your computer? Because that's a great identifier. Even if you're trying to hide that you're on Linux or you're trying to hide uh, what kind of browser you're using, you can check for the system fonts and it gives you real quick an idea of what they're using or what they have available on the, the system. I have some Microsoft fonts in there. Microsoft Sans Serif. Uh, in addition to that, and they're not checking for it, but I have a whole bunch of programming fonts. If you were to add those fonts into your check, you would know that I have Powerline, uh, I have uh, Powerline, Mono, Sans. Uh, I have a whole bunch of different stuff. All identifiers about who I am and what I'm doing. And then they look at your platform, Mac Intel. So they know I'm on a Macintosh. And they know it's an Intel Mac. So they break it down from there. And I'm sure if this was a Power PC, it would probably come back and say Power PC. They check for your user agent. Hey, look at that. Intel Mac OS 10, 10.12. Huh, that's funny. 10.12. Right up there. 10.12. So they know all the way down to the version of the operating system that you're running. That's also important for individuals who may want to um, cause you harm because they can look and check if your browser is running outdated code or they can look and see if your operating system is outdated and checking against CVEs they could potentially find uh, avenues of attack for your system. In addition to that the, the ones who are smart will not execute attack code on a system that is not vulnerable to that attack code. If I look at your system and I'm trying to infect Windows computers, if I'm the bad guy and I say I want to attack these Windows computers because I know that I have a way in through Firefox and I'm going to hit this computer, when the Mac Intel guy who shows up running Chrome, you don't want to try to execute that code. You don't want to send that JavaScript to them. You don't want somebody to potentially get tripped and aware, yes. No, that, that information would be essentially available to anybody who's looking for it. So if you're searching for this information, you've got it. Um, instead of being all doom and gloom, let me take a second here to, to say something happy. Uh, there are web pages that look through this stuff for odd systems. Um, there was a guy who ran a web page who decided to post on Reddit about the fact that somebody using uh, Windows 95 was visiting his web page and he thought that it was fake, that nobody was running Windows 95 or whatever. And he found out that actually he left a message on the web page and said, hey, if you're the guy who's running Windows 95, send me an email at this address. I want to talk to you. Are you really running Windows 95? And the guy got a hold of him and it became like a little thing that they got to discuss and laugh and joke about. So it's not all doom and gloom. Some people use this stuff for fun. But that's not kind of our stuff. But I don't want everybody to to feel 100% bad. <laughs> so then we also check for cookies. They're checking for cookies. They want to know. 
And when I say we, I use that as like an overarching term because I want you to think about it in terms of, of us and them. I want to take care of my computer. I want to take care of my family. I want to take care of the people in my household and I want to make sure that I'm secure and I don't wake up one day with a bunch of bills on my credit card, right? They want to do bad things, yes. Mm -hmm. Sure, and it also goes back to the fact that some people are using their cell phone, right? Almost 50% of the web is viewed on a cell phone size screen nowadays. So instead of going to a laptop or going to a computer, people are headed to tablets. I'm looking around right now and I see tablets. I see people who are on tablets instead of traditional computer screens. So they need that information. They need to know, is this person going to be coming to my web page and using a screen about the size of a candy bar to try to view my web page, or are they going to be coming to my web page to try to view that web page in a 4K monitor that's 65 inches? And the persons that they are going to spend more time on trying to take care of are obviously going to be the ones that are using the more likely uh, hardware. I run a 55-inch uh, 4K monitor. That is my monitor at home. That's also my monitor at work. So when I go to web pages, oftentimes the web page is much larger than my screen. Or I'm my, sorry, my screen is much larger than the web page. The web page sits essentially in the middle of my screen and I have lots and lots of space on the other sides. It's very rare for me to find a page right now that takes up the full screen. So that is the browser and that's fingerprinting the browser. Does everybody understand the whole point of being able to fingerprint a browser? Everybody understand the kind of information that, that individuals are looking for, why they want to do it? And I'm glad that you brought up the fact that there are positives to this as well. Again, not all doom and gloom. Yes? Uh, if I ran a virtual machine, uh, would it show my actual hardware or the virtual machine? Good question. So we're actually going to talk about that. I'm going to get into that here in a second. but it would show the virtual machine. What's that? It is. That is extremely handy. <laughs> Does anybody here not know what a virtual machine is? Because I, I, I will take a step back to sort of discuss virtual machines for just a second, just to kind of catch everybody up. OK, so a virtual machine is a way of being able to run a computer within another computer. Think of it that way. OK, that's the most basic and bare model, OK? So now we're hitting Docker. And Docker can be used to containerize your browser. Now, I am a member of the Phoenix Linux Users Group. And if you don't know what that means, I'm going to give you a hint. It means I like Linux. OK? I like Linux. Linux is great. Linux is a wonderful operating system. Well, <laughs> well. <laughs> Linux is very, very easy to use with Docker. Linux is very, very easy to use with SSH forwarding. And you can start running applications inside of Docker in order to containerize them, as Docker likes to call it. But in addition to that, individuals who see that browser will see your container machine. Individuals who attempt to infect your computer will often leave their payload within the Docker machine. Uh, I want to give you all some of the benefits of Docker. And in addition to that, uh, I will, we're going to have this talk available. I actually wrote my entire talk in Markdown. So this is Vim. This is Markdown. The whole thing is actually going to be part of my web page. And then in addition to that, all this information will be made available to everybody. Because we're going to start getting into commands soon and stuff like that. And so once we get a little bit further down, I'm sure everybody here will want to be able to go in there and start doing some copy paste. So right here is a link that takes us to a container. And I'm going to go to this. And this is GitHub. 
And if you're not aware, GitHub should be your new best friend. GitHub is a wonderful place. And this is Docker running Firefox. And this is Docker running Firefox. Just Firefox. And you can go in there and you can pull a Docker machine and you can build that Docker machine and you will have a copy of Firefox that you can forward through SSH and you will have access to a window that has Firefox. And it will report that it is inside of that machine. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking this, so I'm just going to say it. What about all the people who are not running Docker inside of Firefox? I just gave them entropy, right? I gave them bits. Now they know that I run Docker, if they were to look at that. However, the more people who do this, the less odd or strange it appears on the internet, right? The more people who are running this stuff, the less different it is. So the only way to change how much entropy this is worth is with you. You're the sole decision makers on whether or not stuff like this takes off or fades away. And this is not the only way to do it, okay? But I like Docker because you can use something like Alpine Linux, which comes out to about 15 megabytes. And you can add Docker on top of that. Or I'm sorry, not Docker. You can add Firefox on top of that. And you can end up with maybe 35, 55 megabytes. And you can run Firefox through that. And essentially, it is a completely standalone, containerized, and stood off web browser for you to use. And it gets more fun. Right now, we're just talking about Firefox, right? You've got your machine, you've got Firefox, you log into it, great. Let's talk, a while, talk about a little bit about why this is good. Now, Docker is different than using something like Vagrant. So if you're familiar with Vagrant, it is a little bit different. Some of the ways that it builds stuff is a little bit different. But we have four main parts to Docker that enhance our security. And the first one is going to be kernel namespacing. Because namespaces are going to provide the isolation between the processes in the container and the processes in the other containers or the host itself. Wow, people care about that, right? No, nobody cares about that. Great, what does that actually mean? The namespacing essentially means that the kernel that is being run in order to make that copy of Firefox work or the Tor browser works or when we start setting up a Tor proxy, it should not be able to communicate with anything else on the box, whether the host or other Docker boxes on that machine without our sole permission. So that means that that little container is in a world all by itself until we interact with it. And it keeps it away from everything else. In addition to that, for those of you who are in networking or interested in networking, you can assume that the containers, all of them, are on bridged interfaces, and they should simply be treated like physical machines that have a common Ethernet switch. So it's just like hooking up a whole bunch of boxes to the exact same switch, and that's it in your mind, OK? In addition to that, both the network stack and the sockets and interfaces to the containers, they don't have privileged access to each other, again, unless you give it. You have to provide that privileged access. The next thing is the daemon security that comes from Docker. So a Docker container should not be able to exhaust memory, CPU, disk IO, or bring down the host system. It simply should not be able to do that. If you kill the Docker machine, your host box should stay up. Now this protects you against things like DDoS or DOS. Uh, denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, it prevents your system from being affected when one of the Docker containers is affected. And this is also invaluable if you're on a multi-tenant system. So if there's a whole bunch of you all using the same computer or having access to the same computer, and that Docker machine dies, you potentially would not hurt any of the other machines on the network, and other people would be able to continue to function. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm the only person who uses my computer. But we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi and some of these hardware devices that can be used to create uh, 
Tor routers to use as a VPS router or a VPN router. Uh, and then in addition to that, you can set up that box to where people who connect to it can then connect and spawn their own copies of Firefox directly from the box. So you could have multiple people using that Raspberry Pi to spin up a copy of Firefox or the Tor browser or so on and so forth. And then in addition to that, all of the network traffic that is going through that box is being sent out to your virtual private network or through Tor, depending on your needs. So then we're also going to talk about configuration on Docker. Your daemon does not require root access. And any user permitted to use Docker or control that daemon should be well vetted. So something you need to keep in mind when you're setting up Docker. You can share folders with Docker. You can share folders with Vagrant. You can share folders with uh, VirtualBox, right? I'm sure everybody here has probably set up a virtual machine and then shared a folder so that they could transfer files back and forth between their host machine and the, the box itself. Now with Docker, you can go in there and you can share forward slash. So for those of you who have some experience with Linux, that means the root of the box. You can share that directory. And then once that directory has been shared with Docker, it can be edited by Docker essentially giving whoever has access to that Docker machine full root access to the box. Now I tell this to you because it is invaluable knowledge for you to understand that when you are configuring something like Docker for your personal security, you do not want to make things worse for yourself, right? Like you don't want to sit down and start setting up Docker and then open up a, a hole or, or some sort of avenue of attack for your computer that is worse than whatever it was that you were trying to defend against. So because of that hardened kernel, container, so hardened kernel container security and using Docker and being able to set up uh, essentially anything that you want to run, you can run it under Docker. There is a, a benefit to the idea of the more things that you place into Docker, the more secure things get. So if you're going to use Docker, start considering the fact that you're going to want to use it and you're going to want to use it more and more for more and more items because the more things stood off from each other, containerized and controlled by you, the more effective you get. Uh, some of us here may have used things like intrusion detection systems, IDSs, some of us who are working in networking have tools like that. Once you start moving things into containers, you can set up your uh, IDS, like Bro. There is an actual IDS called Bro, if you were not aware. You can set up Bro to monitor and to look for oddities in that traffic. All of the behavior of whatever it is that you're doing, you start to get an idea of that map of what should be happening, how should it be happening, and where should it be happening. And if you see changes in that behavior, that informs you immediately that there's a problem. Now, when you start going down this road, and when you start looking at security sort of holistically, out of all of the things that you need to worry about, there's so many things, right? And I'm sure for some of us, it, it feels very overwhelming. Um, and again, you don't have to if you don't want to, but has anybody here ever set up a VPS? Virtual private server, a few of you, handful. For those of you who have set up a VPS, have you ever tailed your SSH logs? Set down tail dash F, looked at the SSH logs, and just seen a wall of text of people trying to brute force the server. Just constantly and consistently, people are trying admin, 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 admin one, so on and so forth. Why? Because they're just looking for an opportunity for somebody to mess up or put something on the internet using a default username and password or for a, from a list of usernames and passwords that have been broken into before and they want to break in. When I was first starting with VPSs and servers and stuff, that used to bother me intensely. I would sit there and I would look at those logs and I would be so angry, so mad. How dare they? How dare they be trying to get into my server? That's my server. What do you think you're doing? Why would you be doing that? Up to no good in my neighborhood. I don't want that, right? But you start to learn to mitigate it. Start using tools like fail to ban, 
Start looking for opportunities to take whatever it is that they're doing to you, keep an eye on it, automate it, and set it up so that whatever it is that they're attempting, you can keep that from being effective against you. And eventually they move on. You block enough IP addresses, you keep an eye on it for long enough, and eventually they realize, hey, I'm wasting money trying to get into this server. This script is not going to work. It keeps breaking halfway through. I keep running up into an access denied situation. And they poof, head off to another server. Docker gives you much more fine grained control of what you're doing. But the trade off to that is time and effort, education, work. Same thing with some of these products that we were talking about earlier. I tell you about Facebook and Google. Google gives you things, correct? We have email, we have video hosting. We've got Google Plus, which like literally maybe four people ever used. But it's there, right? They offered it. If you wanted it, you could come and get it. But all of these items are convenient. And what you're doing is you're trading your convenience for security. When you start moving away from those ecosystems and placing barriers between you and those folks, what you're trading is your time for convenience. So it's the amount of effort that you want to expend. Does that make sense? You got a question? Oh, sorry. Yep. Docker is similar to Lightning, but it's better. I don't want to use the word better. It's different. The the concepts are are very similar, and the the methods by which you're going to interact with that box are sort of similar. You're going to have a command that you run. Uh, you can download boxes off of the internet. You can create your own. You can do a lot of the same stuff similar to Vagrant. But um, the benefits to Docker are the way that the machines are built. You're not building individual virtual machines. You have an overarching Docker virtual machine that everything goes into and then it breaks it up. Uh, I don't have any pictures of it, but if you were to go to the Docker web page, you can actually see um, some pretty good infographics on the difference between how the kernel handles the virtual machine from Vagrant and then how it would handle it from Docker. So if you're interested in a little bit more of the low level stuff, that's all out there. So again, just to reiterate as we're moving forward. If you're going to manage your services with Docker, browsers, so on and so forth, as you start to move towards that, you're going to want to do it more and more because it becomes more effective the more that you leverage the tool. If you only use the if you are only leveraging that tool for a single browser, not as effective as it would be if you start placing more and more items into it. So let's take a moment to talk about two things that are very, very important. And that's going to be our advertising and surveillance capitalism, and then social credit. And this goes back to the Chinese, but we'll get there. So Google remarketing is one form of advertising that requires as much information about their audience as possible. Google and other companies have a vested interest in knowing who you are. So you may have surfed over to a website about dogs and later received targeted ads about dogs in your browser only moments later. We've talked about this. This is an example of Google remarketing. But there are three major psychographic segments in advertising, and those are personality, lifestyle, and interest. That's what makes you. Your personality, your lifestyle, what are you doing? When you go home, they want to know that. What do you do inside your house? That information is worth money. That's the surveillance capitalism. The more eyes on you, the more that's worth something. Because again, I can take my money and I can go throw that against the wall and hope that that flashy ad of somebody dancing and then it screams out, hello, into your browser, maybe that's going to catch one or two person's attention. Bring them to my web page and they'll pull out the credit card real quick and say, man, I love those ads. That's where I'm going to spend my money right now. But for the most part, it's ineffective. There is somebody. In a, in a Brazilian call center or a Jamaican call center whose sole purpose in life 
is to sit there at the computer and surf through those web pages over and over and over again to pull that money down and then leave them with nothing to, to show for it. And if you were not aware, uh, Jamaica is one of the major call center areas for that kind of behavior because we built call centers there and then when they were ineffective, we left, but we left the infrastructure there. So that's also where they go whenever they um, break into your computer and they do ransomware. When you pick up the phone and call a call center, oftentimes it will go over into that area because they already have all of the infrastructure that we built for those call centers, but then we took the businesses out. So who you are, what you are, what you do, it's real and it's worth real money. You are the product. And some of you may have heard this. If you're not paying for the product, you were the product. Your Google Gmail account, somebody goes through that constantly, that's used constantly to pull information about you. Every email that you write, every email that you receive, they look at it, they go through all the advertisements, they look for what you put into spam, they look at what you take out of spam. All of that is valuable, it's worth something. Now the Chinese are starting to get into this as well. We all know that we have a credit system here in the United States. You have a credit score. Essentially, if you work anywhere and have a job, or you've been banking, or you've purchased a car, or essentially done anything, you're gonna end up with a credit score. Somebody's gonna write something down about you in one of three bureaus. China does not have that. Uh, something like 84% of Chinese citizens as of 2015, did not have a bank account. Their society is mostly cash. They operate off of a cash and barter system. So now they're moving to what's called social credit. So are you a good citizen? Are you supporting the appropriate political party? Are you practicing good life habits? Do you refrain from behavior that could be indicative of wrong thought? They're going to implement, and they are working on this, uh, the, the finalization for the program should be right around 2020, and it's coming from Alibaba. Uh, through the last couple of years, they've been doing a test process of this right now, aka they uh, take certain peoples in certain communities and give them access to this, and they track these individuals just to see how effective it is. And then there's uh, three or four companies that are competing right now to decide who will be the main one, if you want the, the history of this. So what they're doing is they're looking at your social media, social media use. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Twitter is outlawed in China, so they use other, their social media. Everything's essentially handled by a company called Alibaba. Uh, your medical history. So are you a responsible parent? Because then your score is going to go up because you bought diapers. They actually look. Did you go to this store? Did you purchase diapers? We're going to make an assumption here that you're a parent, and because you bought diapers, your score goes up. But if there is somebody in your household who spends more than an hour each day playing video games, that person is going to be considered idle. Somebody in your home is idle, and you are being irresponsible because you haven't stepped in to stop that person from being idle. So then the irresponsibility score for the entire household goes down and it lowers the whole household score. So it pays not to be idle. You actually receive an award for it. Am I moving too much? Sorry. So social credit is gonna be used to measure whether people are compatible on dating sites. So if you wanna get on a dating site, they first they check your score, and then they put you with people who are in the same score group. Uh, or whether you're allowed specific privileges. If your score is too low, you can't use an airplane. So if you want to travel or go somewhere, well, you can no longer do so because your score is not appropriate. Uh, even to rent a home, to purchase a house, any of that stuff, if the score isn't right, you can't live in specific neighborhoods. And the concept has now been gamified as well. So you get to carry around your mobile phone and it has your score on it and then you can compete with friends and family to see who has the best score and then report on each other good things and bad things in order to raise their score or lower their score. So if you want to go and tattle on somebody who has a very high score and tell them about how that person was talking about using Twitter, they can go run an investigation real quick and then their score goes down and yours goes up. 
because you help the party. In addition to that, there's a special list for VIP users. Oh yeah, there's VIP users for this as well. You want to be a teacher, a journalist, a medical doctor, or potentially a tour guide? You're going to have to have a very high score. Because if not, you're going to risk losing your job. You're going to risk losing your title. You're going to risk losing essentially everything. You make a mistake, your score goes down, you cannot be in that position anymore. They're also going to use it to keep track of your taxes. So are you paying your taxes or not? Goes towards your score or lowers your score. Get a traffic ticket, they're looking for that. Your criminal record, they want to know about it. Your academic degrees and club memberships, party membership, and then even if females have been instructed to take birth control, so if your doctor has stated you can no longer have children, you must take birth control, that will be monitored inside of your social applications and your credit. So your score controls that. The entire life of a Chinese citizen is going to be tracked and graded for acceptability, and this data will be used for all manner of decisions. Top to bottom. That's what they're using this online information for over there. You do something online, they look for it. You search for the wrong thing, you want to look up democracy? Ooh, your score's going down, buddy. Now I talked about Google. And I, I'm Google now I talked about I Google. And I, I'm picking on Google, and if anybody here works for Google, because I know y'all are in the neighborhood, sorry. But there's lots of news articles. So a really good one is, I just talked about Google email, right? Your email, if you have a Gmail account, it's available to people. People can look inside of it. Well, a Google employee stalked underage girls. And in addition to that, a second individual who also behaved in a similar manner was also fired. Now, no information on that second person and their alleged violations of company policy was revealed other than the fact that, hey, they did something they weren't supposed to do. It was sort of similar to this other guy, and we had to get rid of him. This first individual, the employee who was stalking underage girls, what he was doing was he would meet people online at like clubs, uh, you know, hey, this is a coding club for kids. And then to impress them, he would go into their Google Voice account and listen to their conversations and record them and then play them back. Uh, he would pull their emails and go send them their emails. Uh, one of the kids had a girlfriend, but wouldn't tell that gentleman what that girlfriend's name was. So he went through his emails, found out what the, the girl's name was, and then sent her a message just so that everybody knew that he had done it? Yes. So, there is an investigation? So, there is an investigation that they have discussed. Now, in the news articles that I've seen, I saw no disposition. I would assume when you're doing things like that, at the very least, he was fired. Now, from where else that goes, I don't know. I don't have a disposition. I don't know if any investigation was done. But we do know for a fact that it happened, and the person was let go for those indiscretions. Now, that goes back to if I have access. See, because when, they, when you want to charge somebody for a computer-related crime in like accessing data, you, if that individual has legal right to use that computer, they can't really charge them for that. So that's sort of a, an issue because if his job was where he had legal access to get into that data, and then of course they revoked it, which means that he lost his job and he no longer had access to it, during the time period in which he had actual access to the data, then I would assume, and this is just personal opinion, but I would make the assumption that there was no crime committed because of the fact that he legally had access to the data. They had given him that data. Now we're giving them data, and this goes back to things like uh, Facebook revelations released by Snowden. They're looking at your Facebook. Well, yeah. Did you read the EULA? Like it says, we have access to all your pictures, we have access to all your data, and we can do anything we want with it. Like that's all those 10,000 words in there essentially said, anything that you give us, we can do whatever we want with it. And people said, okay. And then they posted. 
and they put information about themselves and they put their pictures online and they put all their data online and then they were shocked, shocked I tell you, when they found out that people were looking at it. So I think that this goes back to you have to understand the value of who you are and what you have because everybody in this room is extremely valuable. We're valuable to businesses. We're valuable to, to other people. We're valuable to ourselves, to each other, so on and so forth. But there are people who have placed a dollar value on your data. And you need to be aware of it. So after that, Google employee decided to stalk underage girls and boys and, and do all of the stuff that he did. He was released. Uh, they went in there and they cleared house. They released another employee. Uh, probably during the audit process, figured out that somebody else was doing it. We trade privacy. We trade many of our liberties for the convenience of these tools. This is a trade-off that only you can decide if it's worth it. Because can somebody look at this information? Yes. Has people gotten in trouble for looking at this information? Yes. People have used it. They've looked at it. They've done things. Things that they should not have done. Were they punished? Yes. Sufficiently? I don't know. Who knows? But it goes back to you, as a user, have to decide. Do I want to take the time to learn how this stuff works? Do I want to set up an alternative account? Am I willing to administrate a mail-in-a-box account to have my own own cloud instead of a Dropbox and to have my own mail server instead of use Gmail? and so on and so forth. There's tons of tools out there that can replace this stuff, but it's an investment because then no longer are you the product. There are even companies that will allow you to pay them to do some of this stuff, but what I want to keep in mind and what I want all of you to keep in mind is we've all heard of Ashley Madison and the Ashley Madison hack and what were people doing? They were paying money to be forgotten and they were not forgotten. People signed up for a dating web page, and then they said, you know what? I got what I wanted out of it, or I didn't get anything out of it and I'm done, whatever their mindset was at the time. And they said, but I am finished. And they said, here's 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever it is that they paid for information scrubbing, and said, get rid of my name, get rid of my address, get rid of my credit card data. And they said, okay, and they accepted the money. And then what they did with that information was they kept it. Why? Because the information was valuable. And then when somebody broke into the system and pulled all the data down, it essentially said, this person paid us 150 bucks to delete all their information. Here's all their information. So just because you're paying money or forking out cash for a service, if you do not control that service, you have no reasonable expectation that that service is secure or correct. That's the bottom line. If you get nothing else out of this class, if you're using a service controlled by somebody else, then you are relying on that other person. Make sense? You are. It's what it breaks down to. In addition to that, for those of us who have installed some of this stuff on our phone, there's a really good link that'll be available. Um, they can predict where your cell phone will be in 24 hours within about 20 meters. Just by watching the data that they have available to them from your Google account, from your Apple account, whatever it is that uses GPS data, they can take that and they can aggregate it. And with enough time, they can make an assumption of exactly where you'll be at any time within about a 24 hour leeway and about 20 meters, they can guess. And for anybody who's thinking, wow, that's great. For the most part, most of us have a job. We have a schedule. We follow a schedule. Everybody has some place that they're gonna be, right? This, this is not magic, it's just math. They look at this person works a nine to five job, Monday through Friday, we can take that data and we can say that we can guess that they will most likely be at their job. At any time throughout the month, that person 
on a Monday will be at their job hating Mondays, right? Okay. But the information is still there. When you say they, you're talking about the data miners, correct? Correct. Anybody who's been able to mine your data. So uh, essentially what they did to gather this information was they were able to go out to people and ask them for their Google uh, traffic. And your phone tracks you when you have Google installed on your phone. It essentially tracks your location at all times. And if you don't have all of that turned off, they can see all of that information and they keep track of it for essentially forever. So they took that information, printed it out, ran it through an algorithm, and then they were able to say, okay, we can make a guess of where you're going to be at any one time. What's your favorite restaurant? Where do you work? All of that information using your GPS coordinates that are readily available from that service provider. That's all. How much time do we have? We have a little bit of time. Great. Okay. So now I want to talk about virtual private networks. OpenVPN is your gold standard for secure private networks. If you are going to use a VPN and they do not allow you to use OpenVPN, you can make an assumption that there is a problem. OpenVPN, gold standard, okay? Now, a paid VPN does not equal magical anonymous silver bullet. When anonymous was at the height of what they were doing and they had guys like Sabu out there, they were using something called Hide My Ass. And Hide My Ass was a VPN that was available for about $8 a month. And when you paid that money, the web page said, this service hides your traffic and we don't keep logs. Never gonna keep logs, guys. So if you come on over here and you give us eight bucks a month, guess what? You're guaranteed to be anonymous with us. And everybody said, oh great, here's eight bucks a month. Sounds great. And the first thing that happened was American law enforcement went to that group who was in Britain and said, hey, pull the logs on these guys. And they said, yup, here you go. And they handed over the logs of the people in Anonymous. And they immediately had those logs. Why? Because the service said, for $8 a month, we will hide your traffic. Guess what? No. Easy as that. No, it doesn't work like that. Just because somebody says that they're hiding your logs or obfuscating your traffic or so on and so forth, that is not necessarily true. So if you are sitting here thinking to yourself, well, to hide myself from advertisers and to control my online identity and to prevent the capitalistic surveillance group to sit around and, and data mine my data, I'll just run off to a VPN, right? It does not work that way because a VPN could potentially still be selling your data. Some of us probably have seen free VPNs, right? A couple of us? Yep. And it says, oh, use our VPN. It's 100% free. Just sign up. Get hooked up. Depending on how they're making their money off of you, potentially they're SSL bumping you, AKA they've got a proxy in between and you connect and they knock your SSL connection off and they essentially become a man in the middle attack. And so you ask for a web page and they go out and they get it and they decrypt it and then hand it to you. And then you communicate with that web page and they're decrypting in the middle and they're looking at stuff. The only way to block that is TLS if you weren't aware. So for those of you who are curious about SSL bumping, you better make sure you're also using TLS. Basically, if you are not the sole controller in terms of hardware, software, and the pipe running that hardware and software, you cannot consider a paid service as secure. You just, you simply, you cannot. And depending on what you're trying to do with it, you're not going to be able to use it to you know, further some sort of empire and get away with it. Because even though it says no logs and no this and no that, and that everything's 100% secure, you would be shocked how easy it is to go out to a country and just say, hey, look, we got a problem. This person's doing X, Y, and Z. What do you got for us? And even though it says we'll protect you, their tolerance only goes so far. 
before somebody will get up and say, you know what, here's the logs. Do what you got to do. In addition to that, if the VPN's free, you're the product. Keep that in mind. Yes? Is there anybody who keeps reliable records of like the most reliable services, like Electronic Frontier Foundation? When you say reliability? Uh, since some, like, is there a group that keeps track of paid services that you can't rely on to the best of the best of the ability to get your information? Is there, is there any authority that you can trust? So in my personal opinion, anybody who says that they are an authority in that is probably not very trustworthy because there really is no way to know. Frontier Foundation. Not even, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that they would do anything malicious to you, but what I am telling you is it is very difficult to vet hundreds if not thousands of different products and different groups and at no time can you, and this goes to the idea of, you know, ever vigilant if you read the Harry Potter stuff, or you're, you have to stay paranoid. Yes? So if I use a Russian VPN, um, America's not going to get their loans, right? <laughs> I'm just asking. <laughs> For a friend. For a friend, of course. So... I am sure that there is somebody out there, there is some company out there who is so anti-American that they would take your American money and give you a hidey hole to stay in forever and they would never tell anybody. But there is nothing stopping anybody from cooperating. There is no law that says that they cannot cooperate. So if somebody were to go to Russia and say, hey, look, buddy, I need some help. This is the issue that we have at hand. This is a heinous crime that we're looking at. And I'm, I'm not saying that somebody in Russia is going to look and say, oh, they, this dude downloaded the Spice Girls soundtrack 14 times. Are you guys ready to cause an international incident here? It's not going to be like that. But there is certain varying levels of cooperation out there within the government that Sometimes people pass information over. It happens. So, again, what I said was, if you don't control it all, potentially somebody controls it and they can look at it. So now let's talk about Tor, because this is when it gets juicy, right? Ooh, Tor, scary. Tor is a big name. Everybody talks about Tor. We know about stuff like Silk Road and all of these other subjects that people see Tor and they immediately get... Darknet, right? That's a buzzword. That's a real good buzzword. Darknet. Tor is not perfect. Just Let's just hit that right off the bat. We've talked about entropy, right? And we've talked about being able to identify people. I got a link up here. Law enforcement tracks down bomb threat. How? Through Tor. What? Tor is unbreakable. Right? No. If you're the only dude using Tor in a 100 mile radius, and a bomb threat is called in from Tor, guess what? We know it was you. <laughs> we know. If, again, what did I talk about? The Docker stuff, right? If I'm the only one that's using Docker to put all my browsers into, I got a problem, because you all know it's me. But if more people decide to do that, when you start using these tools and everybody moves towards these tools, it changes the game. Because now you can't say, oh, I see a Docker browser here. Pfft, that's Aaron. 100%, I know it's him. Same thing here. You had a gentleman who didn't want to take his test. Maybe I shouldn't say this because I see some MCC folks here. Right? <laughs> So we had an individual. He didn't want to take a test. He wasn't prepared for it. So what does he do? He hops on tour and he calls in a bomb threat and he says, hey, if you guys have this test, blowing the whole place up. And so they go, well, call law enforcement. And the first thing law enforcement does is they look at the records and this guy was sitting inside of his dorm at his college, connected to the college internet, and out of all the people at that college who were connected to the internet, he was the only one on tour. 
There was no other tour users at the time. And they went in there, and they knocked on his door, and they said, dude, did you call in a bomb threat? And the guy said, yeah, I did. You guys got me. And he was done. Because it's not hard. When you are the person that's different, when, you are the, when you're the, um, I've heard it as, you know, the nail who sticks up gets hammered down. If you're, the, if you're the one that everybody can see, it's very easy to identify you. Same thing here. That was a lot of entropy, right? If I look at a, a group of, let's say, 500 people, and you're the only person using Tor, and it goes back to your room, so I know where you're at, I know what room you're in, I know what product you're using, that's a ton of entropy, right? It's very easy to identify that person. So let's go back to Tor. Tor allows you to do a lot of neat things. And Tor is used all over the world to do very positive things. To help people be able to go to web pages. To even help law enforcement. Law enforcement uses Tor to be able to communicate. To be able to go and look at stuff. Tor is a very, very powerful tool that can be used for good things or bad things. Now, generally, we only hear about the bad things. But if you're using this to anonymize your traffic, you need to keep in mind, you can't use Tor like a regular browser. Because at that point, it is just a regular browser that's being sent through one server or another server and then sent back to you. But all of your data goes out. So if you use Tor, you connect to Tor, and then you log into Amazon through Tor, Amazon knows you're there. They know who you are. And now they know that you're on the Tor network because they have an IP address that identifies that exit node as a member of the Tor protocol, and they know you're a Tor user. Does that make sense? Everybody follow? Yes? Wasn't there a law change, though, that the FBI and the federal magistrate can now issue warrants for your you know, arrest or launch an investigation even if you're using Tor or have Tor installed on your device? So that's what they're talking about is, and what you are talking about is uh, essentially a whole bunch of lists leaked out. So if you were a reader of Linux Magazine, you were on a list. Uh, if you owned or looked at Tor, essentially your web uh, ISP was supposed to inform somebody, so you were put on a list. It doesn't mean that they automatically open an investigation. It doesn't mean that like the jack boots are hanging out in front of your house waiting for you to slip up. What? But they have the ability to just by using Tor. They, what it does is by using Tor, it gives them uh, a list. I mean, that's what it breaks down to. Your ISP reports you. Yes. It also, what it does is it limits the number of warrants they need to launch an investigation Correct. Really quicker. It's the streamlining process. Sure. Um, I don't know all of the laws behind that, and I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not your lawyer. So keep that in mind. But yes, information came out that stated, you know, if you're looking at Linux or you're looking at Tor or you are any level of advanced computer user, you're essentially on the list of people who could potentially do bad things. Um, keep in mind as well, with the WikiLeaks stuff that's coming out, I'm sure everybody here has spent an evening sitting on their cell phone, going through Vault 7, looking at all of the documents. I'm sure that that's a thing that happens. Um, if you have not noticed, essentially every copy of Windows from Windows XP forward is 100% compromised in terms of things that they can install on it and things they can do and so on and so forth. Um, Tor, again, is not a magic bullet. You don't sign up for Tor and your computer is completely safe from all threats and you're an anonymous person and you're the next Mr. Robot. It's not how it works. What we're discussing here is how you can take your online persona and you can secure it against advertisers. You can secure it against things that you feel are threats. But at the end of the day, when you actually look at some of the products that are in use right now and the stuff that they can get into and get around, even stuff like this is no guarantee against anything. Okay? Like it's just not.
We can break it down that far. It's that easy. But if you're using Tor, you have to disable things like cookies, JavaScript, Java, plugins. You have to use Web 1.0. Because once you switch to Web 2.0, web what was Web 2.0 used for? Tracking, for figuring out who you are, adding all of the information about who you are into a database somewhere so they can make money off of it. So if you try to mix the two, it does not mesh. Me, I'm a big proponent of Gopher. I, I, some people chuckle. Some of you are looking at me like, what is he talking about? Gopher, what's Gopher? Gopher protocol, the protocol before the internet. The original protocol, where all you had was files and text, and there was no two-way communication. There was not forms. There was not cookies. There was not any of the stuff that they now exploit. Gopher, that was where it was at. I could go to your web page and get some data from you, and I didn't have to worry about you trying to data mine me. Because at worst, you had my IP address. You didn't have access to my browser data. You had access to nothing. Uh, as a side note, a pet project of mine is getting Gopher to work with Tor. That's what I'm working on in my private time. Now again, that goes towards if you're doing that, and you're using that as a protocol to trade information. Well, guess what? That's real easy to fingerprint because there's like three of us. OK? So it's not like you're not going to be able to figure out who we are. But it's a project, and it's something to do to try to help. Um, so we talked about Tor. Everybody knows the history of Tor. It's a DARPA project. Comes from the Navy. OK, good. Let's talk about proxies for a minute. A proxy server can be used to transport traffic from a single application. It offers no additional encryption beyond that offered by the protocol used and is only good for mundane tasks. Proxies are not a way to secure your system. Anybody who's heard like, oh, ha, ha, you'll never get me. I'm behind 12 proxies or whatever it is. Proxies are a way for you to do things like access Netflix from another country. If you're out of the country and you need access to Netflix, you can use a proxy because a proxy allows you to bounce traffic without encrypting the traffic and changing the way that it looks. So somebody who's looking at your packets will not necessarily notice that all of your packets and all of your traffic is now encrypted. You're making less noise with a proxy. But it's not going to add encryption. It's not going to give additional security to any of your stuff. That's not what it's for. Okay? A generic proxy, especially a free one, is going to essentially be a tool to spy on you. There are tons and tons of videos on YouTube of somebody sitting there running Squid and a proxy, releasing it out to the internet, and then watching hundreds upon hundreds of scammers run their information through it. And there was a guy on YouTube who did nothing but sit around and get the emails from the people who were being scammed through his proxy, and then send them warning letters that said, hey, you're being scammed. And that's what he had set up. Because people who use proxies, they don't care about the security. They don't care about extra encryption. They don't care about any of that stuff. And again, it goes back to they can also do SSL bumping. So if they're the ones that control that area and you're going through it, potentially they can get access to your stuff. You're going to need to use TLS, especially if it's squid. So here is our Docker for Tor. There is a Tor browser in Docker. And if you're running a Linux computer, it's real easy. All the commands are right here. All you do is you build your image, and then you can browse the web. And you have access to the Tor browser. You don't have to download the Tor browser. You don't have to be running it on your system. And you don't have to worry about if there is an exploit within the Tor browser, them exploiting it and then coming back into your computer, they get into the Docker machine as opposed to your system. Again, standoff, layers of security, layers. I might have a VPN, and then my web browser runs through a Docker machine. And I, that Docker machine may not even be on my machine. Potentially, I have it on a Raspberry Pi. And I'm doing 
exporting over SSH in order to access that. Again, it's just layers. Layer upon layer upon layer where you make the decision on how far you want to go. In addition to that, hey, look at this. Here's another Docker. Oh, it's on two lines. Hold on. Sorry. Well, whatever. I'll just explain it. It's fine. Or I can go here, actually. We'll do that there. So this is using Alpine. Again, Docker with Tor. This is a 15 megabyte image. 15 megabytes. I'm going to assume everybody here with a computer probably has 15 megabytes available to them. Most likely. You can run Tor, you can run Provoxy, and you can have a Tor proxy set up on a system in less than 15, in less than 16 megabytes. 15 megabytes, let's just say, let's just round it to that. With something like this set up, again, you can set this up, you can run your Firefox through another machine, you can set up your browser any way you want, and then anything that you want to send out to Tor, you can send it through a Tor proxy. And then it doesn't capture all of your traffic. Now that could be good or bad depending on how you like to do things. For somebody like me, I have a lot of IP tables where I forward things different places. So it's very good for me for not everything to be captured. I want only specific things to go to specific places. But again, Docker. And that's going to be sort of a theme, a running theme here, Docker. So let's go over some of the answers here. How many bits did we need? 33. You need 33 bits. Why? Because in general, you need at least two items. And those two items to the 33rd power gives us about 8.5 billion people. So at 7.1, 7.3, that drops us off right at round 2 to the 33rd. There are three major psychographic segments in advertising. They want to know your personality, they want to know your lifestyle, and they want to know your interests. Things that we generally feel are private, right? What I do at home alone, that's private to me. Those are the things that they want access to in advertising. Those are the targets that they have. They want to know your personality. What's going to make you tick? What excites you? How can I attract you to click or to look, to keep eyes on product? Fingers on the wallet, right? That's where we want you. And then your interests. What are you interested in? Because that's you. Your interests make you. And those interests are oftentimes worth money. Uh, Google Remarketing is a tracking advertiser. There's tons of them. You can go to any web page, install Ghostery, and just go down the list, and it will pull all of those trackers, and you can start looking at them, and you can see all of the companies that are taking your data and trading them amongst each other. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of companies. So that should tell you something. Yes? Now, if you were able to backtrack those, would you be able to, like with what you're doing, itemizing? seeing your traffic, can you actually block those? You can. So there's lots of options for that. You can block them inside of the browser, like with Ghostery. And then there are um, host files. And if you don't know, you have an Etsy host file, etc forward slash hosts. That's on Linux. Um, under Windows, the host file is located a different place that I have no idea what it is, because uh, it's Windows. But also under Mac, Etsy hosts is the same file, forward slash etc forward slash hosts. There are lists on GitHub and other places that just give you a 14 to 28,000 IP address long host file of stuff to block. And it would block those web pages, it would block those IP lists, it would block those domain names, 
and keep your system from ever communicating with them. Again, layered. Because you're still going to want to use Ghostry because you never know when they're going to register a new IP address or a CDN is going to register a new IP address and that CDN is going to send your traffic somewhere else. But you can have that. I, you know what? I think my... Nope. I took it off. So my personal computer, I have about a 28 thousand line long Etsy host file full of denies. My work computer does not. So because I'm also a web developer and so I have to be able to see things so I can't block everything. That's why I took it off of this. Uh, a proxy. Essentially used for displaying a different IP or impersonating a country. It has low security. Okay. A VPN. Higher security implements encryption over stuff that is not encrypted. So that encryption can be used to defend you, to put a little barrier between you and somebody else trying to look at the traffic. Uh, during our previous class that we had last month, uh, we talked about something called Wireshark. So if we're all connected to a network, just a second, sorry. So if we're all connected to the same wire um, network, like CPD Guest, and somebody's running Wireshark, potentially any unencrypted traffic could be viewed by other people that are on that network. So like if you go to a coffee shop, or you go somewhere else in public where information is readily available, other people can sit on that network and look at that data. Now, I made the mistake of forgetting today in my car, uh, my Raspberry Pi. I have a Raspberry Pi, a device, hardware, physical hardware device, running two wireless network cards on it, and it is a wireless access point. So when I go somewhere, like a coffee shop, or to a public wireless network, I take out my wireless Raspberry Pi, and I connect to it, and then I have that wireless Raspberry Pi connect to the Wi-Fi. Standoff, layered. So now all of my devices are set to automatically connect to my access point. It is on a segregated network that nobody else has access to. It is running an IDS, intrusion detection system. So if somebody's trying to get into it, I know about it. And then in addition to that, it even has like movies and music and other stuff that I host on it. So I have those files readily available to any of my devices. So if I want to set my headphones into my phone and sit there and watch a movie or do something like that, all of that is available off of my box on my own little segregated network. In the investment of time. I took time to build something like that, but at the end of the day, if somebody else is on that public wireless network or they're sitting around at the coffee shop scanning networks, they may see that I have that device there, but I'm running fail to ban I'm running an IDS, I'm running tons of different stuff on it, and I feel like that enhances my security. Oh, and it also connects to my VPN. So all my traffic goes out to the VPN. So I don't even have to run a VPN like on my phone. And for those of you who may purchase a VPN that costs money per device, or maybe they'll give you three devices for X amount of money and then three more devices for more, using something like this, all of your devices go through that VPN and you only show up as one device. And then Tor. So Tor is a protocol used for the explicit purpose of providing anonymity. Um, Tor is not a silver bullet. Using Tor does not make you magically invisible. Tor is not a way of 100% defending yourself against everything and all known threats and so on and so forth. It just isn't. It's not going to do that, but Tor has a place. Um, Tor can be used for a lot of good stuff, but it has to be used in layers. Because at the end of the day, just because you connect to Tor, as soon as you start connecting to eBay, and then now you want to check your Amazon, and now you got to turn on cookies, and you need Flash, 
and you need all of this other stuff, you're just running a browser through a slow protocol. That's all you're doing. So some final personal recommendations. If at all possible, move your services and applications as appropriate to Docker. If you can, do it. If you can't, well, you can't. But it's something to investigate. If you have time in the evenings, take a look. See if it is something that you could potentially do because the benefits are very, very great. Consider mail in a box. Mail in a box dot email right down here. Mail in a box. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for everybody. Mail in the box allows you to become your own mail service provider as well as your own Dropbox. I pay approximately $5 a month for a VPS, virtual private server, located in Holland. I have my mail in a box on that server in Holland. I have a own cloud all set up through this and it's very easy to use. And essentially everybody who's interested in getting away from GAPS, Google applications, or moving away from any of the tools that you may be reliant on, this is a very, very gentle introduction to that. Because you can get yourself a little VPS from wherever it is that you want to do it, DigitalOcean, tons of different places. For those of you who are students, there are places that will give you a VPS for a year, two years for free. Some places will even give you stuff that will last your entire educational career. So if you're going to be in school for the next four years, you can sign up for some of these products and they will give it to you for free until you're done being a student. As soon as you graduate, that's the day it goes away. But for those of you who have started now and you might be in school for four or six years, hey, that's four to six years of free stuff. So Mail in a Box lets you become your own mail server. You just need a domain name. Get yourself a domain name and it's all broken down. You have a video, you have step-by-step -step instructions, you have tons of information here that shows you how to do this stuff. Now, it is a pre-packaged product and other people work on it. It's an open source product. So you can go and you can review the code, you can look at how it's done. Maybe you can even decide, you know what, I don't want to do it this way, I just want to see what they're doing and go do it myself. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. But it's just something to keep in mind. And the GitHub repository is really good. And the gentleman who works on this, the, the main owner of this project, he is ex exceptionally good on answering questions. He has replied to me in, co in conversation and communication before. And he has no problem in talking to other people. Very, very nice. And then the final recommendation that I would make is if you have the capability to do so, you can either donate money or time and run yourself a Tor Relay node. Or if you feel particularly daring and your knowledge and skills are extremely high, potentially you could look at running an exit node. But contributing to the privacy of others would give you, it has given me, it has given me uh, a much greater understanding and appreciation for the privacy and the things that I have. I have run exit. Uh, I have not run exit nodes. I have run relay nodes, and I have run uh, educational stuff for Tor. So that is how I have tried to give back to some of the community in terms of hey, you know, if you are an individual in a country that does not believe in free speech and you would like to look at some stuff about democracy. Well, guess what? I got a server that'll do that for you. So there's stuff like that out there. Um, I like freedom. I like privacy. I like our rights. I like the fact that we can come together in a room like this and we can talk and nobody has to be worried. It's nice. I want that. I want that a lot. And so that's the whole point of trying to show some of this. So. Uh, we are rounding down to the end. We've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything I can address? Yes? Two of them, actually. Go for it. <laughs> First one is, uh, I just wondered uh, your thoughts on the uh, home VPN servers that are popping up in the Dropbox store. 
Sure. You want me to answer that first? Yeah. Okay. So one of the concerns I have with that is those are being used by criminal elements to get a foothold into people's houses. And if not set up correctly, they pose an extreme danger to people who don't understand what they're putting on their network. Is it an awesome concept? Yes. That's a cool concept. Hey, an easy VPN that allows you to get in and out of your network or to obfuscate traffic or whatever it is that you want to do, awesome. But when deployed incorrectly, which is more likely for somebody who wants to buy an easy solution like that without any kind of setup, they may not understand exactly what they're doing on their network, it poses a danger. So awesome concept, great product, but it really requires somebody to step in and give a quite a bit of education on what you're doing when you open up a door like that into your own home. Does that answer that? Okay. Uh, the second question is Google. I've had the same email address for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So even if I got rid of the application, the, the, the application itself is not the thing that they own. It's all the information passing sure. through the email address. Right? Yeah. So, for example, so, and they're not going to delete it. Once you move away, it's not gone. But um, it took me, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with everybody, it took me about a year and a half to get away from Google. I have used Google since Gmail was invite only. I was part of the initial rollout of Gmail. And I loved it. But I also love privacy, and I love freedom, and I have a lot of things that I disagree with. And so I moved towards doing that. And one way that I got away from it was I set up my own email server and I started forwarding my emails from that Gmail account to my email. And every weekend I would look at three or four different companies and decide, do I actually need this company? And if I do, I would update my information. And if not, I would set them to a block list. And eventually I weaned myself off. And it's, it's hard. It is. It is very hard. And just one of my favorite things about Google is I can have my bookmarks, everything go with me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. I log in. I've gotten away from that. You lay a 1.0 page with my link. So now I go to like a private page and there are my bookmarks. I don't have to log into Google. But. So Mail in a Box has WebDAV. So it does do that. I have all of my contacts. I have all of my uh, calendar. All of those things that I loved so dearly. I have been able to move away from that to be able to use it through my own product, which I like that. I like the, I like the feeling of doing it myself. Yes? Speaking of what I'm moving stuff around, what do you think about password managers? So great question. Uh, the question was, what do I think about password managers? Password managers are fantastic. I love them. I do not believe in using the password managers that are managed by somebody else, because it goes back to, I'm giving them all my data. But things like KeePass, I love KeePass. On a personal level, I use KeePass. I think KeePass is great. Anytime somebody asks me to set them up with a password manager, I set them up with KeePass. Uh, and if you are worried about losing your, your password file, the actual key, I oftentimes tell people either set it up on your own cloud and make sure you have regular backups, or if you're using Dropbox, you can place it into Dropbox. I don't recommend Dropbox because, again, you're relying on somebody else's product. And then in addition to that, there have been incidences where product, uh, Dropbox has leaked people's data. It happens. It has happened before. But I think that that is more secure than going with a password manager that like works in the browser where somebody keeps all of your passwords at a centralized server. I have personal concerns about that, so I don't recommend those. Does that make good? Explain? OK. Yes. Um, so the only place that I use that is work because this is my work laptop. So I have an Arch Linux laptop that I use for a personal use. And again, I use KeePass. And so that's what I do with that. But at work, I use the Mac. And it is a fantastic tool. It's great for everything that I do. But I don't have a Mac in my home for personal use. Anybody else? Yes? So what exactly is your preference of Docker over a standard hypervisor such as VirtualBox? So the thing that I enjoy about Docker is the fact that it's, and this is going to sound silly, but I like containers. I like the way that it interacts with the operating system and the way that the kernel interacts. And then in addition to that, 
I like the fact that I can actually look into those machines, see the code that's going to be run, and then run it. And then if I don't like it, I destroy the box and I get rid of it all through the command line, which you can do with VirtualBox. I know I've used the VirtualBox command line interface. But um, the speed at which I can pull down images and get access to pre-built images all through the command line just by saying, uh, let me see if I can reference one of these boxes. Like rd sub has forward slash tor provoxy dash alpine. That actually goes out and gets that public image, pulls it down to my system. I don't have to go download anything. I don't have to, to do any of that installation. Once I run that Docker command, it's going and it's doing all of the configuration for me. And if I do have a concern, I can review all of the things that were run by the system. Does that make sense? Can we also just say, though, that Docker is not a hypervisor? It is not. It, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So you, you still have to have VirtualBox. If you're running Windows, maybe. If you're running Mac, not really anymore. But Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, will have your own uh, thin little VM that runs inside there. But like, the one, the actual one on Mac is a is an X hot VM running Alpine Linux. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, if you're running a Linux operating system, you don't need to have a separate virtual host for all your Docker containers. They can run really directly on your, your Linux box, it's your laptop, or whatever it is. But they're, they're two very, very different things. If you don't know about Docker, you should read up about it um, a little bit. Anybody else? Yes. So, are we at the point yet where this is, you could set something up like this for, say, a 75 year old parent or a grandparent that they would be able to, so you could at least put them in a little bubble of, or, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you're not going to keep them away from Facebook, sure, CNN, Fox, et cetera. If I was doing something like that and I had like a dedicated machine at the house, you could potentially build like some icons and put some icons on the desktop that automatically run like the connection out to the, the Firefox box. And you could make it pretty seamless in terms of they don't need to know that's there. They just see the Firefox icon and they double click on it just like old school. And it goes out and does all the work in the background. So if you had the ability to set something like that up, potentially yes. But if anything ever went wrong, and that spewed something out to the screen, I'm sure there would be much consternation. <laughs> there's enough support already, so what's a little more? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it would be up to your tolerance. But yeah, I would think that at the, the state of technology as it is right now, potentially, yes. You could set up some icons all over a desktop, sit down and teach somebody to double click here or double click there, and the behavior would essentially be the same and it's pretty seamless and they would just see Firefox show up. Because there's not going to be anything else in between them and that. Good? Answered? OK. Anything else? Yes? Are there tools that, like on your browsing, and it builds up your, your fingerprint, maybe tools that generate faucets, random web browsing, clicking on things that have nothing to do with you? So that is against terms of service. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there right now. Be careful doing something like that, because potentially, if you are reliant on like GAPS, Google Applications, if you are reliant on that stuff and you are caught doing that, potentially within your terms of service, they can cut off service to you. And you could lose your email, or you could lose those products that you're using for doing something like that. But yes, there are scripts, there are programs, there are plugins, there are tons of stuff that generate white noise. They will surf to web pages. They will go look at products. They will do stuff. They will surf through Amazon for hours upon hours on end looking at random information in order to poison the data collection on a user. That stuff does exist. It's out there. Um, but once you start moving over into doing something like that, if it's not random enough and it's not good enough, they will identify it, and potentially you can lose access to whatever it is that you're poisoning. But yes, there are people who do do that. Uh, there's a lot of GitHub code out there 
for different like plugins and for Firefox and stuff like that that do implement that. That is a real thing, yes. Anything else? Yes. So is that document going to be available to us? Yes, that will actually be on my web page soon, and then they'll probably link to it from the plug site. I just need to clean it up a little bit more. There's some spelling mistakes and stuff like that in there. I was hoping to have it up by tonight, but I was a little busy, so I apologize. But yes, it's all written in Markdown, and if you look up here at the top, you can actually see um, that's the YAML for the post itself. So I have the layout, the title, the date, the author, the summary, categories, thumbnails, tags. It even shows images because they're already marked up there in the YAML. Markdown in YAML is fantastic if you didn't know. So how do you set up Docker and can with the Firefox just running? Is it like when I post this up here, there's going to be instructions on how to do it. But if you were to go to Google, look up Docker, read about it, make sure that it fits your needs and then go to GitHub and type in Docker Firefox, you'll find step-by-step -step instructions for everything. The best way to do it is to it in, or is that what you're doing? <laughs> That's my personal preference. It's not necessarily the best way, but I find it to be the easiest and most effective. Yeah. Okay, and you mentioned something else about being secure, like I forgot running something. Okay. Are you looking for it? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll announce it through them because it's not done. I'll come back to you, okay? I saw one. Yes. I'm sure it's my own fault, but your web page would be. Oh, so it's retro64.xyz right now. It's my personal site. I'll have something professional later. Essentially, it's just a breakdown of all my academy stuff and then um, a whole bunch of tutorials on how to do different stuff. If you try to use Docker and Mac, there's a whole bunch of setup that you have to do, so I'm working on that as well. Uh, when you want to do SSH forwarding, if you want to do X forwarding, uh, there's steps that have to be taken. So I'll have that up there as well. Yes? So uh, you said you have to use VPN with TLS to be secure? The reason why is because they can do SSL bumping. So make sure that TLS is set up on your VPN. That's it? Okay. So I am going to close down. So I guess uh, just to end it, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming out. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, I personally really do appreciate every single one of you coming out here and seeing this. I hope it was of some sort of benefit to you all, and I hope you got some food for thought about what's going on out there. So thank you again. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it.